Hi everyone and welcome to our AXME presentation. I'm Dr. Kate Jackson and this is Associate Professor Liz Angsman and we are both from the University of New South Wales. And our talk today is about our approach to online asynchronous lectures. What we're going to be covering in this talk today is the online lectures that we filmed for Physics 1B. We're going to talk about how we set about making them and why we chose to do it in the way that we did. We're also going to be uh, covering the most important points to consider when designing for online delivery and what we see as the future of online learning. So a little bit of context for you, what is Physics 1B? Uh, per week, Physics 1B students have two two-hour lectures or four one-hour web stream lectures per week. Uh, they have two hours of lab with an online asynchronous option uh, for COVID-19 times. And they have a two hour problem solving workshop uh, when things are face to face. But um, when we moved everything online, that became a one hour synchronous session. The first half of Physics 1B covers electromagnetism, whereas the second half covers physical optics and an introduction to quantum mechanics. So when we were designing these lectures, we made sure that we had constructive alignment between the lectures, the laboratories, the problem solving workshops, and also the assessments. So to help with this, we made it really explicit what we expected the students to learn in each of the lectures. So when the student accesses the lecture from Moodle, they can see the learning outcomes for that particular lecture, as well as any of the additional resources that we have associated with that learning material. So in order to make these videos, we're lucky enough to have a small filming studio in the School of Physics. So some of the filming was done in that studio. So the process we used was to script what we wanted in each of the lectures. So we had short videos and then we'd have a question afterwards for the students to try. After scripting it, we go to the film studio and record the bits which were appropriate to do in a film studio. We'd also use screen recording to record worked examples. Um, we then edit it with an editing program. We used ScreenFlow, but there's lots of similar um, programs that you can use. And we'd add in the equations into the background using latex. After filming it and editing it, we uploaded it to our school's YouTube channel so that it could be easily accessed by all the students. So here are a couple of examples of some of the videos that we made. There's one where I've done introduction to capacitance and you can see what it looks like edited with all the equations in the background. And then Kate filmed hers at her house. So she set up her own kind of film studio at her house with a white background. And you can see she's used a similar approach with adding the equations and the important points after filming it. So the, the main, one of the main things that we were trying to concentrate on and be mindful of when making these videos is about cognitive load. So Liz has just described how we would put the equations on um, in the video, in the post-processing. And having the equations appear on the screen as you talk about them reduces the cognitive load for the students. They are looking at that while they are hearing you and getting that information through several different channels is going to help them learn that information better. As you also saw in our videos, we had plain backgrounds. Um, mine was a white background, Liz's was a black background. Um, but with contrasting text. So the students don't have to work too hard to be able to read what is on the screen. We would also try and point to diagrams on the screen. Um, Liz was trying to do the right hand rule, but because <laughs> trying to just trying to do that while, um, while filming was um, a bit difficult to make sure it's all aligned with what the students are seeing. Um, and yeah, also, as Liz said, we would screen capture from tablets. Um, and while doing that, it's actually a really good um, I guess piece of advice that students like following the cursor so if you're trying to circle something make sure that the cursor is also being recorded and that it also appears I should also say too because we were uploading to the um, YouTube channel which I'll talk about now for universal design of learning we were uploading to the YouTube channel because that also it's very accessible to most people of course when some students were um, studying overseas so not only would we host them on the school's YouTube YouTube channel.
channel, but we would also put all the videos onto um, a shared into a shared OneDrive folder or some other medium that they could access because in some countries uh, the students couldn't access YouTube. So that was one of the things that um, that we were mindful of, as well as making sure, you know, we were taking all these principles of for universal design for learning to account. So clarifying um, vocabulary and symbols, for example. Another thing that we want to, I guess, um, draw your attention to is the um, Australian Council of Deans of Science have, uh, I guess, created a resource repository and Liz and I were have both contributed and were sort of heading up the physics um, part for uh, for this repository. So our, all of our videos for Physics 1B are on this website. So we um, recommend that you go have a look. And if you've developed great resources uh, for online learning, please submit them there as well. So other principles that we took into account when designing these online lectures um, was to try and get as much active engagement from the students as we could. So we did this with short videos followed by questions so that they weren't just sitting there for long chunks of time just listening. They had to process and answer a question about it. So one kind of technique that we used quite a lot was predict, observe, explain, which um, is easy to use in a classroom as well. But we found we could also use it online by showing them a video, and getting them to think about what would happen and to lock in a prediction before they watch the second video, which showed them what did happen. And then they need to come up with their own explanation for why that happened before watching us explain it to them. We also tried to engage the students by using real life examples. So for example, Kate was teaching students about diffraction. So she used diffraction of light around her cat's hair to measure the width of the cat's hair. And then we also used cats for the exam questions, for example. So here's a picture of my cat with a balloon and the students were asked to predict what would happen when you rubbed the cat's hair with the balloon. Uh, another thing that we did to um, try and engage students is to inject the just optional, so they the students didn't have to do it, but it was just op optional historical stories about how this science came about. And um, I added the story of Rosalind Franklin in for x-ray crystallography and I got the students to just give me a few comments on what they, um, I guess, what they thought about those, um, about that history story. And they said things like that. It was really interesting to watch. It was nice to actually see um, the, the process behind science and it actually makes the people doing the science more relatable. We were motivated to do this because Asia Banzali in her PhD showed that there was higher student engagement when you include some historical interludes like this. So another thing that we were that we were really mindful of when we were creating these lectures is we had to uh, make sure that we were connecting the information for the students. And that's not just about connecting information to past courses and things that they've already learned. But Liz and I also had to make sure that we were talking to each other because we were doing two different halves of the same course. So, for example, uh, referring to past courses um, is a really useful way to make sure. So things like when students are learning about electrical potential energy, Liz started off with a revision of gravitational potential energy. And that really set the students up for being able to learn it properly. Also, like, like I said before, making sure that uh, we're connecting the two halves together. So Liz finished off um, electromagnetism with Maxwell's equations. And that's exactly where I started off um, talking about light and optics. Uh, another thing that we um, programmed up in these quizzes is, well, firstly, we programmed the lectures up as quizzes. And the reason that we wanted to do that, there are a few different reasons. One of them being that we could track students who were um, going through, which Liz is going to talk about in a little bit. But we also wanted to give the students 
an opportunity to practice what they had just learned. So we would um, have the lectures as short videos and then straight away afterwards, the students would have a couple of practice questions to do. And at the end of the lecture, there would be practice problems that the students could do. The students could navigate however long they wanted through the material, they could keep going back to it. And if the student got it wrong, we would have a solution video come up as you can see here that would show the student exactly how to do it. So getting students to do this constant practice, students had really good feedback on, on this and they really liked um, how um, how they could practice what they had just uh, what they had just learned. And we know that it's better for their learning as well. Okay, so we did look at how long students spent on these lectures. So we know, for example, that when we're giving a lecture face to face, this is very easy to time, whereas it's um, a bit less easy to time when they're doing it online because different students take different amounts of time to answer the problems. And it turned out that the students were mainly spending between 1.5 hours and 2.5 hours on a one hour lecture. So we didn't see this as a problem because the questions have been built into the lectures. So we saw the online lectures as a combination of both tutorials and of lectures. And so we did carefully check the times and make sure that the actual time spent did fit into the 150 hours of allowed time for the lectures. And then in future um, iterations of this course, so for in T T term one this year, for example, we made sure that we explain this very clearly to students in the course outline. So we had both asynchronous and synchronous support available to the students. So we used Blackboard Collaborate for synchronous sessions. So we had um, drop-in sessions where the students could come in and ask about any questions they had about the content. These weren't especially well attended, but the students did appreciate having them there as an option. We also um, have forums for the course and we made sure that we responded really quickly to these problems. And the first time we were running this, we let students know that this was the first time and there was bound to be problems. So please let us know about any problems so that we could fix them up. And the students responded really well to that and let us know about any problems and didn't get too cranky about with us about making mistakes and we fixed them quickly. So it, we encourage students to ask questions on the forums rather than via email because when you when they ask them on the forums all the students can see that and so that you get less repeat questions when the students ask on the forums so because these lectures were set up as quizzes it was really easy to track the engagement of the students so on moodle we could see who'd done it and who hadn't done it so we set up emails um, that we sent out via mail merge, personalized emails to the students who were falling behind. The students really appreciated getting these emails. I was a little worried that they'd get all upset about receiving an email saying that they were falling behind, but they seemed to appreciate that we noticed that they were falling behind and were following up with them and telling them what to do. So what do we see as the future of online learning? Well, we definitely don't think that we should totally get rid of face-to-face -face lectures. So in our Physics 1A course, students have had the option of choosing to enroll in online lectures or face-to-face -face lectures for quite a number of years now. We first introduced these in 2017. And we've measured the learning gains and found that they're similar between the face-to-face -face and online students. Now, most students didn't actually choose to enroll online when this was an option. We have around about a third of the students choosing to take the online lectures and the other two thirds taking the face to face ones. So as part of her PhD, Asia Banzali measured the emotional engagement of students in the face to face lectures and the doing the web stream and the totally online due to COVID. And she found that there was more positive emotions experienced among the students doing face-to-face -face learning. So we definitely don't think that we should get rid of those face-to-face -face lectures. 
That being said, there are some advantages to having these web stream lectures. So for example, in the web stream lectures, we've got solutions to practice problems at the end of each of the lectures. And this means that there's less pressure in class to get through those problems because we can tell the students just to go use the online resource to try this, which means that we can put spend more time class time on actual active learning techniques like doing demonstrations, getting them to make predictions and having class discussions. So we thank you for joining us today. Um, and if you have any questions for us, please come and join us in the Zoom session and we look forward to hopefully seeing you.